founded this. Mark Susar, who's filming this, is also one of the, the organizers. Uh, I want to first of all thank Trustway for setting this up. Uh, it's a really nice venue. The fact we also can have alcohol at a meeting, which is also good. Um, I want to introduce Aaron from Trustwave and let him introduce his company, uh, what they do, and then also introduce uh, the speaker. So guys, take it away, have fun. I'm going to hide in the back and get more beer. <laughs> Save one for me. All right, uh, first of all, guys, thank you for coming. Uh, I won't take much of your time because I know five minutes between you all and Arun probably is not good. So I'm going to just take a couple of minutes and quickly introduce Trustwave, and then we'll let Arun do most of the speaking, right? So Trustwave is an information security and compliance-based company that is headquartered in Chicago. Uh, we have presence in about 16 different countries, uh, and we do customers uh, in around 96 different countries. Uh, we are about 1,100 people to date across the world. Um, the big thing that we do is a lot of data ingestion from our security products. Uh, we have about 20, 25 different products that help make your systems better uh, from a hacking standpoint, from a monitoring standpoint, things like that. And the biggest interest that we have in the big data pieces is to take all that data and make it more mineable and basically add value to our customers that we can prevent hacks and proactively find things before the bad guys do. Right? So that's that's our play into Trustwave, uh, into the product. So a quick thank you to all of you. I wanted to thank Larry, who's our CTO at the back, uh, for you know letting me actually do this. Uh, and then obviously Horton works for you know bringing Arun over. So that's that's all I got. And Arun, take it. Hey Chicago, uh, this, I tried to come here um, last year. It didn't work out. So um, thanks a lot for having me again. Um, definitely thanks a lot to Trustware for having probably the most uh, awesome hug location ever. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm serious. Uh, you won't know the number of you know large nameless conference rooms I've, I've talked about in the event. Uh, it's definitely uh, an upgrade. So thanks. Um, all right. So. Quick introduction, uh, my name is Arun Murthy, I'm one of the founders at uh, Hortonworks. Hortonworks is a company we started about two years ago now, in the uh, middle of 2011. Um, we were basically a bunch of uh, folks working in Hadoop pretty much since day one at Yahoo. We spun out uh, with Yahoo's help and, and Benchmark and then Index being the main investors. Uh, we've been in business for now a couple of years. Um, things are going great, uh, obviously thanks to all people like you who, you know, who are taking a look at Hadoop and giving us great feedback. Um, like I said, all, like a lot of the founding team at Hardworks, I used to be at Yahoo. Um, I used to lead the you know, MapReduce uh, development, um, responsible for co code configuration operations, all of uh, you know, 40, 45,000 nodes of Hadoop. So if anything went wrong, uh, my cell phone would buzz. Um, and that's not a good thing at 3 in the morning. Uh, I've got a really mad wife at home. Um, so doing that, and obviously uh, in the ASF, we got to do uh, pretty much since day one uh, for about seven and a half years now. Uh, Long-term committer, PMC member, I used to be the chair of the PMC. And also relevant to Yarn, I'm also the release manager for Hadoop 2.x, which is where Yarn comes in. Um, so this is sort of the agenda for the day. Um, feel free to stop me at any point and ask me questions. We'll try and make it as attractive as possible. Um, so let's you know walk through why Yarn, right? So, if you look at Hadoop, um, at least if you, if you take a long view of Hadoop, um, like I do, and go back three, four, five years ago, Hadoop then was primarily two things, right? I'm, I'm talking about the core Hadoop project, not the entire Hadoop ecosystem, right? But the core Hadoop project was HDFS and MapReduce. HDFS was the storage, so you put all the data in HDFS, and then the only way to process that data um, was actually to map, run MapReduce on top, right? Now MapReduce is great. I mean, I've been I've been doing MapReduce for a long time, but it also turns out, shockingly, that it's it's not a silver bullet, right? There are a bunch of use cases where MapReduce is not good for. It's great for, you know, a whole bunch of use cases from EDL to, you know, web search and so on, um, but it's not, you know, great for another set, right? 
Now, to give you a bit of context, a lot of the original Hadoop stuff came out of Yahoo web search, right? So like, like with any web search company, we were trying to get um, multiple copies of the web onto Hadoop. Um, day one, our target was to get to 10,000 nodes with you know, 300, 400 petabytes of storage on them. And what we were trying to do back in uh, 2006 was to keep about you know, seven to 10 copies of the web, right? Because what, by many copies of the web, I mean every single web page in the world, right? The reason we had to do that was we wanted to go back in time and see how the web was changing, right? Because then we could come up with the best and the most relevant search algorithms, um, you know, indexing and calling and so on, to actually get the best search experience we could. Now obviously, you know, that quickly turned into something completely different. Uh, obviously, we did solve the web search problem. Um, even in uh, as early as 2007, uh, a lot of web search was being done on Hadoop. Our primary use case at that point was something we call web graph. So I don't know if you guys are familiar with web search. The web graph is actually an application where we take every web page in the world, uh, we model that as a node in a graph, and we, we take every hyperlink and model it as, a, as an edge in the graph. Right? So we're talking about a graph which had, at that point, about 100 million um, nodes and well over two or three trillion edges. Right? So that's the scale that you're talking about. And that's, you know, it's been produced since day one. So going back, map reviews at that point was, was, was sufficient, but it wasn't, it wasn't enough uh, as we went. So what then happened was we saw a lot of other things show up in the Hadoop ecosystem. An example was HBase, right? So HBase was where you do key value store on top of HDFS, and that came on the side. So although HDFS solved the data silo problem, right? By that I mean you now had a single file system or a single namespace, right? To be technically correct, you had a single namespace on which you could put all your data. And we're talking about you know hundreds of petabytes of data if you, if you want, right? Once we did that, we still had what I call a data system silo problem, right? So MapReduce is one system. We now had to build an edge base, we had to build you know, an MPI cluster for modeling, and so on and so on. So we had a bunch of these systems we had to build right next to each other, right? So that's you know, sort of the state of the art um, three, four, five years ago. Now, MapReduce at that point looked like this. Um, it still looks like this for a lot of people learning uh, some version of Hadoop 1. Uh, how many here are familiar with, with what MapReduce does? Okay, fair number. So, Fundamentally, um, the job tracker uh, is the master in the system. The task tracker is shown on every node. Now, it's important to remember, uh, I'll come back to this in a bit later, at a later point, is that the job tracker does two pieces, right? He manages resources in the cluster. By that, I mean which nodes are up, which <coughs> nodes are down, um, where are the three slots, where do I schedule the next set of maps, and so on, right? So that's resource management. And then he also does what I call his job lifecycle management. By that, I mean, you as the end user submit an application, right? You submit a MapReduce job, and that MapReduce job is you know, 5,000 maps and 200 users or whatever it is. So the job tracker is to now break that job down into component tasks, run them on different nodes. So one of the things that MapReduce is really good at is to move compute to the data and not data to compute, right? So what it does is it works with HDFS to figure out where the input files are or the blocks are, and then it tries to schedule the, data, the computation locally so you don't have to do I.O. over the network, right? So it does that, all that work is now job specific, right? So all of this stuff is something you, you have to do a job by job. There's nothing you can do across jobs. Uh, there's more, I mean, if a task fails, it has to go restart the task somewhere else. Uh, it has to do things like speculative execution. How many of you are familiar with speculative execution? Small number. So speculative execution is a feature where the job tracker says, I ran all these tasks for this job, it happens that you know, a small subset of them are really, really slow compared to its own peers. Right? So you ran 100 maps, all of which two or three are slow compared to the, the 99. Right? So then, instead of waiting for that one task to finish, which might take a long time because you're, you have hardware issues or you know, uh, slow networks or whatever it is, um, I've seen everything from corrupt RAM to corrupt disk to corrupt everything, right? to, which causes this issue. So instead of waiting, he will launch the, an alternative copy of the same task on a different node. And now, hopefully, one of them goes faster than the other. Right? So as long as one of them goes faster, you can just kill the other one and go away. That's speculative execution. So all of that stuff is part of the job lifecycle management. 
And we've known for a long while that job lifecycle management is extremely expensive. It's extremely expensive in terms of the CPU we spend in the job tracker. Um, even as far back as 2006, we were fixing issues in the job tracker. Memory and CPU and locks and trying to break them down and so forth. Right? So all that was happening. And the task tracker was you know, a simple agent running on every node. Uh, he would just get commands from the job tracker. Uh, launch this map, launch and reduce. Kill this map, kill this reduce, right? He just does that, right? So that's the job tracker. Any questions before I sort of go on? If you have a job that where you're running <coughs> hundreds of maps, but you notice that you wanted to kill the process because you are blocked that your data is corrupted or something, one of the map identifies that you don't want to proceed anymore. Is there a way to kill the entire job at the time? Um, there's not a direct way, but there are a couple of options. There's not a very direct way to do it. Yeah. Um, so that's MapReduce, right? Now, what are the issues with MapReduce? Um, a, a few of them, um, lots of them, from my perspective, right? So one is scalability. Like I said, the job track was doing two dis disparate things, resource management and job lifecycle management, and we couldn't scale the lifecycle management, right? Now, what this meant was we were limited in our ability to scale Hadoop itself. If we couldn't go beyond 4,000 nodes, well, we sort of pushed it to four and a half, five thousand 5,000 nodes in some cases. And it's not just the node count, but it's also the amount of work you can do per node, right? So the job tracker is to spend a certain amount of CPU cycles for every single task which is running at a given point. So we, once we went beyond 40, 50,000 tasks, which <coughs> equates to about 10 to 12 tasks per node on that hardware, uh, we hit sort of scaling issues, right? Now. It's, it might seem like a lot, but you gotta remember that this 4,000 nodes is you know, something we bought in 2009, right? Now, the gear that you guys are buying today is significantly more capable than the nodes we bought, we bought in 2009. It's more slot, right? So on every single dimension, RAM, CPU, disk, for the same price point, you get much better hardware, right? Which means that if I'm running 10 tasks per node on today's hardware, even though it's the same price, um, we're doing, we're massively underutilizing under the nodes, right? So what this means is we cannot scale the job tracker to more than two, two and a half thousand nodes in today's hardware. If I wait a couple more years, I wouldn't have been able to scale it beyond a thousand nodes, right? Now obviously this is a big problem for Hadoop because Hadoop's built on the promise of sort of scaling linearly across thousands of machines, right? And that's really important for Hadoop itself. So that's a scalability issue. In terms of availability, the job tracker is a single point of failure. If the job tracker fails, we have to go restart all the jobs. That sucks. Um, the other one was utilization. Now, by that, what I mean is that if you guys are familiar with Hadoop today or MapReduce, you know that the job tracker things in terms of map slots and reduce slots, right? So every task tracker has M maps and R reduce slots, right? Now what this means is we have artificially constraining utilization on the node. We've seen a number of issues where, uh, or cases where half the map slots would be, no, the map slots would be full and the reduce would be empty. Right, or vice versa. The problem was the job tracker can't take a reduce task and run map in it, right? Now initially obviously it made sense because it simplified uh, our entire you know, system design, but quickly got to a point where it became a big problem from a utilization perspective. Right. Um, the last one was the obvious one, which is, now this was Hadoop MapReduce, which meant you couldn't do anything else. You couldn't run you know, uh, graph processing or iterative processing or modeling or machine learning or whatever you know, on a native basis. People usually would take MapReduce and sort of um, you know, twist it around to do map, you know, machine learning or whatever, but still it, it wouldn't work as well. Right? So all these are sort of issues we saw with uh, MapReduce. Any, any stories from your guys? So, I don't know, because you guys started day one with Hadoop, um, some of the issues which traditional enterprise faces is you already have data sitting in our analysis system. Um, so, that process of migrating that into Hadoop is not, it's not probably not automated, it's a lot of run work. So, I was wondering if you guys experienced something like that. Well, we definitely did. Um, and <laughs> I wish, looking back now, we had some of the tools we have today. So for example, um, we've been, we at Hardenworks and the rest of the community, we've been working on this project we call Falcon, 
uh, Falcon makes it really easy to move data. Um, you can not only move data, but also set rules that says, I got, two, I got two clusters. One is my primary, and one is my sort of uh, backup cluster. And then what I want to do is get data feeds in into my primary cluster. But also, I want to store a copy of that data in my secondary cluster. But when I put my data on the secondary cluster, don't give me the raw data. Put only the process data in the secondary cluster. So you can do all of these uh, with Falcon. You can set rules. Uh, unfortunately, when we started, we didn't have any of this built. Right? So the tooling was not available. Um, so that's sort of the issues we saw with MapReduce. So, so we, you know, obviously we start thinking about this and say, you know, how do we go fix this? And it was pretty, pretty clear to us that it was not just a, a refactor of do, right? You know, just you know, doing a better, better map reduce system would not help us, right? Especially on the last one, we could not support anything which is not map reduce on do map reduce, right? That was a big problem. So we we wanted to get to a point, uh, which we're now here with do two, was to move away from having just MapReduce as the be-all and end-all of Hadoop, right? So on the left, you see Hadoop 1, and the right, you see Hadoop 2, right? Now, the big change in Hadoop 2, um, obviously, there's a bunch of changes done in HDFS for high availability and so on. But the big change in Hadoop 2 was we built what we call as Yarn. So Yarn is now, you can think of it as a distributed operating system uh, running at scale in a data center. Now, on this operating system, you can run multiple applications, right? MapReduce is one of those applications. You can now run other applications, Storm or Giraffe or Spark or whatever it is, on the same cluster um, in a common fashion, right? And that's really important because we can now deploy one storage system, one compute system, and help people process data in different ways, right? Now, why is that important? Because we our thesis, uh, our, our motto as a company, um, our vision as a company is to say, in, in the next five years, we'll have half the world's data on Hadoop, right? And we're very confident that's going to happen because HDFS is the most economically feasible way to put data, uh, to store data anyway, right? Now, if all the data is coming into HDFS, you want to process that data or interact with that data in multiple ways, right? I'll give you an example. So you've got a bunch of customers um, who are in the telco space, right? And what they want to do is track cell phones, um, you know, CDRs, call data records, as a customer is moving in his network. So as soon as you move from this zip code to another, you're probably moving to a different cell tower. So they want to track you there, right? That's one. If you've got some uh, financial customers who, who, who are trying to do fraud and analytics on top of you. Now, by that, what I mean is, you know, let's say I swipe my credit card, right? Um, and then I'm, I'm here in Chicago. Five minutes later, somebody swiped my credit card in Estonia. There's something wrong, right? You don't want to wait 15 minutes to figure that out or 30 minutes to figure that out. You want to catch it at the point of transaction and flag it, right? So these are use cases of what I call sort of real-time event processing. And that's where you see systems like Storm and, and Escort and, and stuff show up. How many here have heard of Storm? OK, cool. So that's one example. That's right there, right? Now, after that, you've got your data in HDFS. Once you have your data in HDFS, you want to quickly interact with it, right? Your analysts and your data scientists want to test a hypothesis. They've got a hunch or an idea, and they want to test, and they want to you know, validate it with data, right? So that's when interactive SQL and stuff comes in. I'll talk about uh, this, which is a new project I've been working on uh, to do better SQL and video, right? So that's two use cases, real-time event systems, interactive queries. And then obviously you have the you know sort of bread and butter, which is ETL and reporting and batch analytics, right? And that's what MapReduce is really good at. So I don't believe for a moment that MapReduce is going to die. Um, it's just because there's too many use cases which MapReduce is really good at. I, I agree that MapReduce will not be the be all and end all, but it doesn't mean it's going to go away, right? So there's a there's a nuance there. So what you want to do is run all these applications within the context of a common system, right? And that's what Yarn is. Because across your data lifecycle, the way you got data in, you want to do real-time event processing, batch analytics, and real-time analytics, all of this you have to run in a common system. And the analogy I use is, if you go back to Hadoop 1, right, it's sort of having an operating system for your data with only one application, which is Notepad, aka MapReduce. So imagine having an operating system with just a node back. 
it works great because I mean, works okay, right? Because you can do everything you found in this. So now you got the system, right? Where you can run all these other applications. So along with Notepad, you got Word and PowerPoint and Excel, and all of these are running on the same, um, you know, framework. Does that make sense? So that's sort of you know, yarn. And obviously, we want to provide you know sort of common SLAs, common quality of service, security, all the enterprise class features you want to expect, and you want to provide it the core layer. So our people who are building these systems, they don't have to worry about you know all the nitty gritties of stuff. They don't, you don't have to worry about security or different QoS because that's provided as a platform service view. Uh, also, are there any libraries to make visualization? Instead of using traditional BI tools to connect to. So, I mean, we're starting to see some of it. Um, there's Platforma. I don't know if you've heard. Um, we're starting to see some of it. In the open source, I don't really know any, actually, unfortunately. Um, most open source hackers I know hate doing JavaScript or whatever. So. Tabby was one of the best. Sure, but his point was that was. And if you can yeah. spare a little money, that's the best tool. Wait. Yeah. I mean, like you have Z.js and things like that, but I don't know how well. Right. Works. See, yeah. I, I would suck at D3.js. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> so uh, don't expect me to write D3.js. Even, well, even if I do, it would suck really bad. Um, so that's Yarn. So just to sort of step the stage, right? So the key benefits uh, of Yarn um, as we start thinking through this is that. There's scale, obviously. We provide new models and services, right? Our program models, whether it's graph processing, iterative processing, um, and other services, we'll talk more about them. Improved cluster utilization, because we now completely did away with all this artificial notions of map slots and reduce slots. Uh, I'll talk more about what we've done. Uh, the fourth one you know, sounds si simple enough, but that's actually one of my favorites. So one, one of the things we did as we moved away from the Hadoop model was Operating Hadoop at scale, it was quickly obvious to me that we were, so so if you step back, we were providing Hadoop as a service to Yahoo, right? So, or my team was at that point. Uh, we do that for a number of customers today. Now what happens is, if Hadoop is, or MapReduce is a service, and MapReduce is sort of baked in, into your uh, system, every time I have to upgrade MapReduce or change MapReduce, I have to go get permission from all my users, right? It might sound simple, but that's really, really hard to do. Because the users are like, look, I don't care what you do, don't interrupt me. Right? Don't force me to go validate against new version of map use, because that's not you know, business value to me. Obviously, I can go ahead and explain that it's you know, better performance, whatever it is. But still, there's a cost-benefit trade-off, which is hard to make. Right? So as we went into this new system, we wanted to go to a world where we can support multiple versions of the user's application within the same system. Right? By that I mean we want to support you know, MapReduce 2.1.1, 2.1.2, 2.1.5, all in the same system. Right? So if you, Mr. User, are using 2.1.1, nothing should change for you. I, could, I can upgrade Yarn. I can up, you know, provide MapReduce 2.1.8. But you, who's using 1.1, should not have to change anything. Right? It's not unique. Right? I mean, you've had Fig and I, which we can support different versions of. You can support different versions of Python or Perl or whatever on the same machine. We want to do that with Hadoop itself, or MapReduce itself, specifically, right? And the last one is sort of related. Once you do that, we don't want to constrain people to using Java, right? I mean, if the end user wants to use Java, that's great, because it's provide MapReduce, but we want to natively support other uh, programming languages within Hadoop itself, right? Uh, if you're writing C or C++ or Coral Python, we want to support all of that within the same uh, system. I'll talk about what we've done there. So with that context, we'll talk about what Yarn itself. So we, we, we started with Jira in about 2008. So that's how long we've been thinking about this. Um, we spent a couple of years you know, fixing Hadoop 1 itself at that point. So fast forward to 2010, we started working on Yarn. Um, it, it was like spring of 2010, we started working on Yarn. Uh, to a point where you know we spent the last three years in a cave fixed, you know, starting getting it done. Right. Once we did that, we now have Yarn running in several customers, not just Yahoo. Um, Yahoo obviously is the biggest one. They're running 35,000 nodes of Yarn across multiple clusters, and they've been in production for over um, eight months now. So if you go to Yahoo today, you will not find a single job tracker or task tracker 
and you will not find them for the last eight months, right? So we're really confident that not only it scales, but it works really well, right? In fact, we've actually helped Yahoo to a point where, um, you know, the largest clusters, about four or 5,000 nodes each, you know, eight months ago, they're running about uh, 70, 80,000 jobs per day, right, MapReduce jobs. Today, on the same hardware, they're running about 130, 140 jobs, 130, 140,000 jobs per day. It's almost a 2x improvement on the identical hardware without having to spend a, spend a cent, cent of money, right? And that's really cool because that shows what Yarn provides in terms of better utilization and return on investment in Yarn, right? Obviously, if you multiply that over, you know, 2x savings over, you know, 20, 30, 40 million dollars of uh, CapEx and OpEx there, you're talking significant amounts of money. In fact, Yahoo actually, you know, when I left, we had about 45,000 nodes of Fidel. They actually were able to retire Colos, an entire Colo, which is about 10,000 nodes, without actually, and at the same point, actually increase the utilization. Thanks to Yarn. And that's really cool. So entire Colo went away, right, that's about 10,000 nodes, and they're still doing more with Hadoop than they were, you know, eight months ago. That's pretty awesome. Um, obviously, that's a lot of it is, is you know, a lot of it is still map reduced, but outside, we're beginning to see a whole bunch of new applications, which goes back to the previous point that we want to be more than map reduced, we want to go to Java, right? So, uh, we are still using the classic version of map reduce. Mm -hmm. uh, a year back, uh, when we were showing some interest towards the yarn. Mm -hmm. In general, in the community, there was mention that it's still not production ready. So, mm -hmm. how what's the status today? I mean, from what this light, it looks like it's running big in Yahoo. So, does it mean that all the issues that we faced in the initial rollout are fixed? Yes, I mean that's pretty much what we've done uh, for lat late half of last year. Okay, the question was uh, it was not ready a year ago. What has changed since then? Um, I don't have a, a numbers, but if you basically look at Jira accounts and so on, mm -hmm. we spent you know hundreds of bugs, whatever. At that point, we had to, um, and we got. And, and the thing is, once you run things at scale, you'll actually see more bugs than normal, right? Because every corner case will show up, right? So we did a lot of work in the sort of late half of next last year. Uh, we started the rollout um, in about August of last year, so it took us about six months before we could roll it down to all the production clusters. So then we found a number of issues we fixed. Since then, we've done some more fixes uh, since Jan. So at this point, we're really confident. Uh, I don't know if you guys knew, but a couple of weeks ago, I released a Hadoop 2.1 beta. That signifies that not only is the software ready, but also the fact that the API is ready. Right? They're going to be stable for the foreseeable future. Right? So before I sort of... Um, dive into the concepts of, um, sorry, the architecture of Yarn itself. Talk a little bit about concepts here, because that's important. Um, so the first important one is this concept of an application, right? Now, people ask me, why don't we call it a job, right? The reason we don't call it a map job is because people sort of confuse it with the concept of a map reduce job. And frankly, in Yarn, uh, we can actually do two kinds of jobs, right? One is the temporal job like a map reduce. That's going to run for several seconds or minutes or hours or you know, even days. But we also have a concept of services now running within Yarn uh, where you can run that service forever. An example is you know, uh, edge base. So we can now run edge base inside Yarn forever. Or you can run Storm inside Yarn forever. Right? So it's a distinction between something which is temporal in nature, like MapReduce, versus a, a system uh, or a service like edge base. Right? So that's an application. The second one is a container. Now, first up, a container is not equal to a Linux container or whatever. I mean, it's sort of notionally equivalent, but not exactly. So a container in the in, in Yarn Lingua Franca is just the basic unit of allocation, right? So you can, if you think of Yarn as an operating system, um, that there's a scheduler, which is a kernel, right? So he hands out containers, and that's equivalent to a CPU slice or a set of CPU slices in a, in a Unix box, right? So that's the analogy. Now, a container is more than that, of course. Um, it can be you know, CPU and RAM and disk and GPUs and all those things. So a container gives you the right to use a certain amount of resources on a specific machine, right? Now, 
So for example, you can have different kinds of containers. You can have a container with two gigs of RAM and one, one CPU, or six gigs of RAM and eight CPUs. It doesn't really matter, right? So it's all loosely equivalent to the Amazon model of EC2 instances. Although in Amazon, you only get a fixed kind of uh, containers, right? You get small, medium, large, extra large. Here, you can get infinite types, right? So one of the reasons we chose to go with this model is because, again, we can drive utilization much higher if we are more specific about what we handle, right? Obviously, this container is now fixed, uh, replace the fixed map and reduced logs, because now map slots, map tasks, and reduced tasks can run in different containers, right? Different types of containers, different kinds of containers, right? So that's two things. I mean, any questions on, the, on either of them before we keep going? Um, is God required to enable federation? So federation is HDFS. Um, no, Yarn is not required. So Yarn, Yarn actually doesn't know or care about HDFS. In fact, um, my favorite example is LinkedIn. They've been running Yarn in production for over a year, and in their production cluster, they don't have either HDFS or MapReduce. They just run Yarn as a as a operating system, and they run even processing systems there with uh, Kafka, actually. So it's called Samza. They just open source it recently. I don't know if you guys have heard. So it's sort of equivalent to Storm. So they've been running Samza in a, in a Yarn-only cluster for over a year at this point. So do the applications request uh, the resources required for the exactly. container? Exactly. So, and what happens if, if, if you know, applications are always greedy, right? They, they'll err on the upper side end. So what happens if if you if, if it can't fulfill it? Or so um, I'll, if you can hold that question for two more seconds, I'll, I'll walk you through that, right? Um, OK, so before we get into the architecture itself, I, I just want to take a moment to say, what is the design center, right? What is the thesis we started on when we did Yarn, and that was we want to split up the two major functions of the job tracker, that right? is resource management and application management, right? And we separated it out by having a central resource manager, right, and having a master or a job tracker for every job, right? So now every time you submit a MapReduce job, you can sort of loosely think of getting your own job tracker, right? So every single job gets its own job tracker. So we can now scale infinitely because we can run you know, thousands of job trackers if we want to, and we can run different kinds of job trackers. We can run a job tracker for MapReduce, we can run a job tracker for um, Storm, we can run for Giraffe, right? So different kinds of them. So what's the relationship between the container and the job tracker? Um, I, I, I'll come to that in one minute, but to answer your question, a job tracker runs within a container itself. So there's nothing special about the job tracker. He runs in a normal container, um, and that's you know not special. So briefly walk through the architecture. We've got a resource manager um, who is a central global scheduler. Um, and to answer your question, um, he's got the notion of hierarchical queues and so on built in. So as the admin, you could go in and say, you know, five business units bought this one uh, 200 node cluster, and each of them paid 20% each. So each of them, at any given point of time, will get 20% of the resource in the cluster. Right. So that's all managed centrally. And you can make all these policies in the, in the central schedule, right? So what this means is you can have a, a naive or a malicious application ask for you know millions of containers, but that's not going to happen at runtime because the resource manager understands that this application belongs to this queue, it belongs to a certain user, and there are all these limits on how long the how many containers a user can take, how many containers you can give give out in a queue, and so on and so forth, right? So a single Application cannot harm the cluster itself. Does that answer your question? Yeah. So you got that. The node manager is sort of you know similar to the task tracker. It's almost the same code as the task tracker, minus all the map reduce specific stuff. Um, and then, like I said, the new thing is what we call an application master. That's the job tracker you get per job. Right. So there, there's going to be an application master for every application, and he has to manage the uh, resource request allocation and the scheduling of those tests for, for himself. An example is obviously the MapReduce one. So every time you submit a MapReduce job now, in Yarn, you get a MapReduce application master. He goes in and says, I want resources, gets resources from the, from the, uh, from the resource manager, and then runs maps and reviews. That's the question there. So the Sure. 
Sure. So, so your application can say, I want, let's say, two gigs of RAM, and then starts using four or six or eight, right? So at which point, the node manager, who's actually running the container, um, I'll, I'll walk you through a flow, but the node manager is watching the container. So when you launch the container, you have to tell the node manager that I, I only have two gigs of RAM, right? And that's something that happens automatically, I'll talk about it. But fundamentally, the node manager is watching the container, and he will shoot it down if necessary. So that's already, that's built into the framework. Um, you can't take more than you did, than you were allocated. Does that answer your question? Yeah. So, so if your containers come from all different forms of shapes, is it possible that the container is denied something to do, sort of like a log star or something like that? So in other words, the old manual says, uh, we got very little resources, so they never assign that. That's a resource manager doing it. Yeah, the resource manager might not give it to you, but then you've got the queuing mechanisms, and the queues will, will always bubble up to the top of the queue. Right? So you'll always bubble up to the top of the queue, and you'll get your resource at some point in time. Right? So the guarantees we make are SLAs at the queue level. Right? We say, you pay 20% of whatever it is, doesn't matter. You have 20% queue capacity. So at any point, we will make sure that your applications in your queue get 20%. You can even say, Make sure you divide that 20% over 10 users or 15. So you can set all these admin policies as the resource manager, um, and the resource manager will behave. Right? Uh, those containers, are they have your hierarchical structure? Are the containers in some ca inside containers, or are they just flat? Um, I'm not sure there's a question. So the queues are hierarchical, right? So you can set up a top level queue. No, no, containers itself. Would you create a container and run more complicated things, which in, in its turn has its kind of request right. resource allocation? And OK, so a container is basically, like I said, a unit of allocation. The code you run within the container, the, the yarn doesn't care. You can run Perl or Python or Fork or whatever you do, but there's limits on the resources. There's limits on you know file descriptors. Anything you can think of, there are limits. Right? So as long as you're within the limits, you can do whatever you want. But if you bypass the limits on any dimension, you'll get shot, right? So there are limits there. So basically, you cannot create container inside container. No. You can fork, though. I mean, it doesn't really matter. But you still have, you can't, there's limits on how much you can fork. You talk about both uh, the temporal, term temporal, you have a service or you have a job. Right. So this, can you walk through a, an example of a service like HBase in terms of getting a resource and not having to deal with, let's say, swapping? Yeah. Uh, give me, it's uh, five minutes on the presentation. Yeah. Okay, so let's just, you know, before we sort of get, let's walk through um, an application flow, right? So what you see here is you've got a resource manager at the top. He's the scheduler. Um, you've got a bunch of node managers. You've got some containers allocated. Um, just to sort of give you guys, uh, you know, this sort of denotes that symbol there denotes the resource manager. This symbol there here denotes the node manager. And the one on the right denotes the fact that it's also a data node, right? So it's like you still have the same model with Hadoop, but you deploy data nodes and DOS trackers or data nodes and node managers in the same node, right? So now what happens is an application comes in. He submits an application, right? So there's a client submitting an application. Now the first thing the resource manager does is that he will allocate a, a regular container, right? And then he will start and then he will get the that regular container to run the code for the application master, right? Now the resource manager isn't doing anything smart here. The client is telling him, I want you know, X amount of CPU and X amount of uh, RAM for the application master container. Oh, by the way, here is the code on HTFS for you to run, run in the application master, right? So what you do is the client is actually putting some code on HTFS in, in, a, in a path somewhere and saying, I want six CPUs and two gigs of RAM for this AM. And boom, the resource manager is going to start that process with that code. Right? So the resource man the node manager is actually going to do the smart thing of trying to download the code from HDFS, set it up, set up the environment, and then launch the process. Right? So the node manager is basically just forking the process after setting up the environment. Environment may be jars, it might be shared objects, it might be environment variables, command line, whatever you want. Right? You can completely describe a Unix process to the node manager. I'll talk more about it in terms of APIs. So an AM comes up, right? He's running the code the client told, right? So there's nothing special about this. You can 
we can now see why we can run multiple versions, right? You can you can just point to different versions of your code on HDFS. So now you can just point to different directories to get different versions of MapReduce, right? Right, and it's not special because that directory can have Storm code or Giraffe code or whatever it is, right? This all the application code is completely agnostic uh, from, from Yarn's perspective, right? So the AM comes up, and now he starts requesting resources from the resource manager, right? He says, I want 10 containers, each with two gigs of RAM and one CPU. I also want 20 other containers with four gigs of RAM and one CPU. Different applications, different types, different priorities. So then, based on the policies you set, you might get different kinds of containers at different points in time. Right? So let's say, for example, that he gets a container uh, on this node here, and he starts running container 2.1. Right? So remember, the, the allocation came from the resource manager to the AM on the same protocol. It's the AM's responsibility to now talk to the node manager to launch the container. Right? So depending on the number of containers you got, you run different containers on different nodes. Right? And one more. Make sense? Any questions about the general flow? Mark? Is it useful to have um, uh, active, active backup uh, failover for the resource manager? We already have that. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it's now in dev, so that probably would come in Hadoop 2.1. Uh, but we definitely have a Zookeeper based um, RM which we can fail over. With this. We can actually use the same code from HDFS for the so, failover. Dumb question. So the application master is. Providing the, so MapReduce 2.0 right. version of all the environment information. So that's going to be from Exactly. So it's two steps, right? So the application, the client is providing for the application master, and the application master is providing it for the containers. Right? Um, so all the environment and stuff is specified either by the client or the or by the application master. Right? Now it's also important to remember that here there's a sort of a parent-child relationship. If any of these, so the resource manager is the parent for the application master, right? The Unix analogy, and the application master is the is the parent for the containers, right? So what this means is, if a container fails, his parent is responsible for getting another container or restarting it. So in this case, if a container fails, it's the app master's responsibility to go talk to the resource manager and get extra containers, right? It's important to remember that the system doesn't do it automatically. Right? If one of these containers fails, the resource manager isn't going to say, oh, you lost a container, I'll try to give you another one. The resource manager doesn't care. It's responsible to the AM to get it. Now, it's important we did that because that is the only way we can scale the system. Right? We can now scale the system to thousands uh, of machines and 100,000 plus containers because the resource manager is doing really little work. Right? He's just doing allocations. So who decides where you get your containers? And talk about the resource request protocol. Um, in the resource request protocol, the application master can specify exactly where he wants the containers okay, on specific nodes. All right, because I was going to ask a follow-up question on the <coughs> Right. <coughs> exactly. I mean, there are different ways you can do it. You can say, I'll talk more. Uh, I'll mean, go into much more detail. Yeah, especially things like region servers on HBase might require one on every. Exactly. Exactly. All of that stuff is exactly. in the resource protocol. Right. Okay. Some other question? With similar question. I'll talk about the research question. Yeah. Also, uh, what's the cascade effect in terms of points of failure? So the application master fails. It's a good question. So when an application master fails, uh, you can do two kinds of things. One is by default, the you know going back to the Unix analogy, the parent is died, and a bunch of children. So what happens in Unix? The init process takes over. In this case, the resource manager takes over, and he can either shoot down all the children or bring up a new AM and point the children there. Right? So it's a, in some ways, it's a grandparent's responsibility here to take advantage. So the AM fails. So AM is on this node. If that node goes away, the resource manager will figure it out that that node went. He knows that there's an application master running there. So he's going to just inherit its children and either kill them or point them to a new AM. But is that Does the application master have any status record in terms of where it has to be 
like I said, there are two cases here, right? One is the application master can write some state. Uh, the, the scheduler can just either kill all its containers, bring up new AM, point it back to the old state. Right? That's usually on HDFS. So the map reduce AM works that way. Right? I'll talk more about it. The other one is just shoot everything out, just start a new AM and just give it the state, um, and then he starts from there. Okay, so it's it depends on the application. The, the point is we can't actually make a very generic one because we don't know what application this is. It could be Storm or HBase or MapReduce. In each of those cases, the checkpointing stuff is very different. So we actually, Yarn leaves it to the application to do it. So I'll ask some question. Yeah. So each data node has its own node master, right? Node manager. Node manager, sorry. Exactly like the task tracker. Yeah. Yes, and uh, what if uh, all the data nodes are using like a SAM solution for its storage? So how? What? Uh, so like I said, Garn doesn't care whether you're running it on SAN or NAS or whatever. As long as you, you have to run the node managers on, on part of it, right? So he knows that. It's just that if you're running on SAN, you won't get any locality. Any other questions? I want to make sure this makes sense because that's really important as we get into the details of uh, the protocol and so on. All right. So let's you know figure out what it takes now to actually build an application given the context that you have, right? Um, so before we go there, these are the applications which are already available today, right? And this is personally the most exciting part for me because I've been working on this for three years, and now to see a lot of other you know you know communities and, and vendors take advantage of it is really nice. Uh, yesterday actually, um, the Spring guys announced some deep integration with Spring in Yarn. So I, I'm not much into Spring, but if you're into Spring. You can write all this fancy XML now, and you get you know, all Spring containers everywhere, right, with Yarn. Um, <laughs> so the one which, you know, the, the important ones I like are obviously Hoya, which is HBase on Yarn, I'll talk about it. Uh, even processing with Storm is for other commercial platforms, and you know, that's also interesting because I'm now seeing a whole bunch of uh, commercial vendors, uh, both <laughs> proprietary and open source, take advantage of Yarn and build new applications on top. Some of them are actually proprietary, right? So I know I, I, I advise at least a few startups who are doing this. Um, and we know things like, um, who is it? Data Rush is putting one of their products onto Yarn. It's, it's, it's exciting stuff. So this is something that we've been working on. I'll, I'll touch a little more on that. That's for Interactive SQL. Um, MPI, so if you guys are, I, I just learned today from Mark that some people here also call it MPP. Um, it's MPI or MPP. Both of those things actually now work in Yarn. So there's Open MPI and MPI CHU. So They're popular implementations. The, the actual Open MPI yes. distribution contains a Yarn. Um, um, or, or do you have to? You have to get a piece of code. Um, so Open MPI and MPI CHU are both different. So yeah, yeah. Open yeah. MPI already supports different resource managers. Right. Dark, Moi, Slurm, all these things. Right. I believe it's been checked into Open MPI. So if you just get Open MPI, some version of it. It has support for Yarn by oh. default. Okay. Um, MPI CH2, um, there's some code on GitHub. Okay. Um, I can point you that if you want. Yeah, yeah. and uh, there's an application master to do MPI CH2. Now, it's interesting because Open MPI and MPI CH2 are both in C. Right. right? So again, so this is sort of, you know, I didn't have to do the work, or my team didn't have to do the work. It's a completely new community coming over to Yarn and porting their stuff and you know validating what we've done is correct in ports. That's pretty exciting. Right. So, so just to, before we leave that topic, sure. so basically any like existing MPI job. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So you can take any existing open MPI job as long as you have the driver, so talk to Yarn, it just works. And that's really cool. Right? And it's all written in C. So that's pretty awesome. Um, Spark and Giraffe are different things. Spark for machine learning, um, Giraffe for graph processing. All these things have been you know, ported to work on Yarn. Obviously, all of these are enabled because every single one of them, or those communities, they've written an application master. So there's a you know Giraffe application master, an MPI application master, uh, you know Thes and Hoya and so on. Right. So all of them are are one are different ones. Obviously, the key thing is now everything can run the same Hadoop cluster. Right. On your same Hadoop cluster, you can get all these applications in different forms and flavors, which is pretty cool. Any questions about this before I go on? Uh, excuse me, so uh, what how about data, uh, using the same data, so if you have C++ application and uh, MapReduce traditional, 
And so we produce access data through HDFS. Right. How is the plus multiplication access the same data? Through HDFS. I mean, through the, uh, so we've got both things, right? So if you want to access data uh, through C++ APIs, we've got one thing called libhdfs. Um, it's uh, written in JNI. In fact, that's the first line of code I ever wrote for it, Hadoop. Um, so that's the JNI API. The other one is uh, Hadoop also offers a HTTP interface called webhdfs, so you can read and write data through um, the HTTP interface. So you can use either of them. So they don't have their own channel to data to HDFS, they just use traditional, what, 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 not just what, what Hadoop 1 offers. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So you can access that data, it's just in different uh, APIs. Any questions? All right. So if you want to write your own application, uh, what do you do, right? So the thing to remember now is that there are three different protocols, right? There are three different protocols, and in those three protocols, you've got about seven or eight APIs you need to know about. Across the three protocols, there are a total of eight APIs that you need to know. Now, what are the protocols? The first one is for application submission, right? You saw the client submitting the application. There's an application submission protocol that you need to submit application with. The second one is the, the protocol with which you get resources from the resource manager. So a AM gets the resource from the resource manager, right? So that's the application master from the resource manager. And then once you've got the container back, right, you use the container launch protocol to actually launch the container with the node manager. Right? So there's three different protocols and about eight APIs between them. We've got all client libraries for all of them. You don't have to uh, under the hood, Yarn uses uh, uh, protocol buffers, so we can write clients in different languages. But if you're just in Java, there, you've got very simple sort of a uh, Yarn client API which you can use to write applications. Um, so fundamentally what you have to do is write a cl client to submit an application, write an application master um, you know, to actually get resources. Typically, 99% of the applications I know have been you know, copied from an existing one. The first, the simplest one we wrote, uh, you know, even before we did MapReduce, was this application we called Distributed Shell. Distributed Shell is very simple. It just launches n copies of a Unix command. Right? It's, it's not very, very fancy, but it just launches n copies of a Unix command. Right? So if you're familiar with PDS search or whatever, this is done, right? So a lot of people just take distributed shell and copy paste it and write different application code, right? So we sort of joke that distributed shell is the new work now, right? So everybody took work on and modified it. Now everybody's taking distributed shell and modifying it, right? So once you get containers, you can run whatever you want, right? So you get the containers, you can now specify you know everything you want to run a Perl or Python or C or C++ application, right? <laughs> Um, before you sort of uh, jump into the protocols, uh, there's a bunch of concepts you need to understand. Uh, to do you know, resource allocation itself, you have to understand what's a resource request. That goes back to your original question, how, how do the application get resources? A container is the result of a resource request. So you make a bunch of resource requests, you get a bunch of containers back. Right? Um, it's important also to remember that a container is just an allocation. Right, you still have to go physically launch the container and provide enough information for the node manager to fork that container. Right? That information is provided within a container launch context. Right? So basically, a container launch context completely specifies a full Unix process. What libraries you want, what environment you want, what command line you want, so that, the, so that we can actually fork that process to you. Local resource is interesting. So with local resource, you can specify that before you launch my container, make sure you copy all these uh, resources from HDFS, right? So if you're writing a Java application, you want a job, a job's on HDFS, you can give a URI, right? So node manager is gonna take that URI, pop, download it. It can be a jar, it can be a shared object, it can be a library, right? All of that uh, is specifiable. Now the application master itself, um, you got two different concepts. There's an application ID, which is for the application, the application attempt ID just signifies that the application master can die and come back. So it's different avatars of the same application, right? If it all goes well, you only get one application attempt ID ever. But if something fails, you get another one, right? The last one is an application submission context. This is basically, you can think of it as the specification for the AM itself, right? So the client has to provide what I call the application submission context. And that includes all the information that the resource manager needs to launch the AM container. Right? Um, we'll walk through each of them. Any questions here? 
All right. Um, resource request. So resource request is how an application, or even the client actually, uh, requests containers in the, in the system, right? So the client has to make the resource request for the AM, and the AM makes the resource request for the other containers. So you primarily have to remember about four things that you have here. One is priority. So resource request has a priority. What this means is within your application, you might want containers of different priorities. So for example, in MapReduce, we use it to run map tasks and reduce tasks. Right? There's no point in launching reduce tasks until the map tasks are done, or at least partially done. So we use priority to specify relationships. Right? Resource name, this is the node on which you want the resource. Right? So you can say, I want, I, the MapReduce AM, know that I have these splits on these nodes. So I'm going to first look at the splits and then put the resource name in my resource request to get free containers on that node. So, so do I have to do the get splits myself and then request the containers? Um, so if you're writing your own application, yes, you have to. But the map reduce AM does all this for you. Okay. So from the end user perspective, there's no difference. Right? Okay. Yeah. So for map reduce, we already wrote, I mean, we already, my team already wrote the application master which does all it's this. It's a follow the existing data. Exactly. Question. So if a map node is being reused as a reduce node, mm -hmm. um, if there's any cleanup that needs to be done on a container, is it, is it the AM's responsibility? So the cleanup is done by the node manager. As long as the container goes away, it has to clean it up. Because there are cases where you might exit in an unclean fashion. Right? So it's all done by the node manager. Right? Uh, just to uh, you know, key thing to remember is that a resource name does not have to be a node, node ID or a node name of a host. It can even be the name of a rack. So you can say, look, I don't care what you give me, but just give me a container on that rack. Right? There's a special value of star, which means I don't care where you give me, just give me a container. Right? So there's host name, rack name, and star. Star says, I don't care about locality, just give me a container. Resource name says, give me a container only on that track. Right? Now, what's really interesting about Yarn is that it's the only resource manager I know at scale, which actually does this locality-based stuff at uh, automatically for you. Which means, if you specify a host name as part of your resource name, and for some reason Yarn can't find enough resource on that host for a while, it'll try for a while, right? It'll automatically degrade down to the rack. If it can't find it on the rack, it'll automatically degrade it to some other rack. Right? And that's really important because otherwise, the application master had to do all this. Right? So all of this is sort of provided out of the box by the resource manager himself. Right? And this is the only resource manager I know at scale which works this way. Right? Dark, Moi, Moab, Slurm, uh, none of these things work uh, with data locality. And that was really important for us because we really wanted to build the best system to run MapReduce. Right? Without this, it would be really hard to get good performance out of MapReduce. Right? Um, and then obviously there's a capability. Here you're asking for CPU, RAM, all those things. Last one is the number of containers. So instead of saying, give me one container, one container, one container, you can say, give me 10 containers of this kind. Right? So just a, a field that says, give me n containers. Any questions on resource request? <laughs> So the classic uh, MapReduce model, mm -hmm. so as a user submitting the application, right? So what we provide is, this is the memory requirement for my application. Exactly. So through the Java options, we mm -hmm. specify the uh, memory XMX. Right. right. Mm -hmm. So, and then the, the priority also that map task should be done and the reduce. So that's internally handled. That exactly. I don't specify as a user. Right. So when you talk about this resource request and all this uh, terminologies, right? Mm -hmm. Priority, containers, and all this stuff. Is it something that is handled? So even though we say it's a client, are we talking about the uh, client library which you have built exactly. that automatically handles this based on the configuration? Exactly. So, so as you, you said, I'm not exposed to You're this not exposed to any of this. You, right. you still continue to say jobconf.set mapper class, set reducer class, job.submit. Okay. Right, or job client.submit. All of this is automatically handled by the map reduce client libraries. So it'll look at your XMX, it'll translate it down to a resource request. Right. Um, it'll figure out the input splits, it'll figure out you know, 10 maps, 20 interviews, whatever it is. All of it, from the end user perspective, there is no difference between running on video one and video two. In fact, um, I'll talk more about this, but we, 
one of the reasons we took you know time this year to build this was we actually got to a point we've now got to a point where Hadoop one is binary compatible with Hadoop two, which means you can take not just your existing code and recompile it or whatever, you can take an existing binary or a jar, point it to Hadoop two and it just works. So you as the end user can take that same jar, work, and you just point to better performance in Hadoop two. That's a you know positive cycle. There's nothing negative about it, right? So it's it's very important uh, for end users that we, there's no change, right? I just want to make emphasize that more than once that if you're an end user and you're, you're running Hadoop and MapReduce, you don't have to worry at all, right? If you're big or high, you don't have to worry. So when, as a user, so when can I customize some of the stuff? So is it like when? Because all this are hidden behind the client library, right? So uh, if I have to change some of the things or modify some of the existing, right? You got to go change the client library. Okay. I mean, that at that point you're writing a new application in some some definition, right? You're obviously modifying Hadoop, but you're modifying a, a version of MapReduce for yourself. Obviously, you're welcome to write a completely new application. Where at that point you're back, you you have to figure out all this yourself. If you're writing an application from scratch, so if you're writing Storm, for example. They had to figure out all this by themselves, right? So, um, going up a little bit let's say I have a special library that I only send specific codes, right? And I have an application that's in the library, and when I'm requesting, mm -hmm. I understand I have to specify, but how do I tell the system that only this code? Right. I, I know from my experience with some good engine that you can extend to do that and well, there's a lot of parallels right. at least to me from what Sun Grid engine was doing more money. So there to to answer your question, there are two ways to do it. One is you as the application writer know exactly the resource names or the host names. At which point I, I didn't put the full resource request, but there there are fields here in the resource request which says Give me containers on this node and this node alone. So you can say that, right? The other one we're in the process of implementing, uh, which is slightly different, is we're going to add this notion of um, we've got code. I'm sure at this point it's just not to wait. Um, we're going to add the notion of labels to nodes, right? So you can now go the admin. That's only on the admin's control, by the way. So the end users can't do it. Right. In some way, I would do it in Exactly. You can tag nodes. Right. You can tag nodes, and we'll add the we'll add the notion of a label to the resource request, right? So instead of specifying a resource name, you can just say star. Right? It means I don't care. But then you can put labels and say I only want containers on nodes with these labels. Yeah. So I can tag. You can tag. Well, the definition of you is admin. The admin can tag. You as the user can ask for resource on that yeah, node. Right. So it's a two-step. It's a two-step process. Is there a way to actually get your network map so you can do things like get me an instance on every node? We, so if you want to do just say get instance on every node, there's a different way to specify it. You can just say star, um, and there's a parallelism you can mention. I haven't, I mean, I didn't put all the details here, but you can do it. You can even say just give me 10 containers on just a specific rack. Right. So you can do all of that. Yeah, there, there are things like what I would want is probably one running on one rack each, right? So you know, or if right. the rack goes down, I want high availability. Yeah. Things like that. Exactly. There's ways to do it. I just didn't specify the protocol. It's just, I mean, fundamentally, we have a very complex protocol. I'm just trying to uh, not you know, blow your brains out right now. Uh, but you can do all of that with your own. We've, we've built it with all these things in the, in, in mind. Yeah. Um, no, Yarn doesn't know about the data itself. Like I said, it's the, the it's the application master doing the translation. Uh, what Yarn does have is a bunch of things like health checks on a node. So if a node is failing consistently, so uh, Yarn will automatically take it out of rotation. Right. So those sort of things are built into Yarn, but not anything to do with data because Yarn doesn't know or care about data in, in some sense. Does that answer your question? Yeah. I was thinking about like load data. So in terms of that situation, there's only a 
so much, there's only a finite amount of resources on that node, right? CPU, RAM, disk. So Yarn can only allocate so many containers at a given point. So there's no way you can get more than what you ask for, right? Or you can't like go, at, at, concurrently, we won't oversubscribe a node, right? So that way you're protected, but you might get poor locality because of that. Some guys might get the locality, some of the guys won't. But fundamentally, that's a feature we have to add in HDFS to sort of dynamically you know, look at access patterns and move data. That's not really a yarn concern at this point. The question here? And, uh, does it work equally well if you uh, have not physical nodes, but virtual nodes, far more virtual machines? So one of the things we're adding, um, and we haven't done it yet, is, so right now we have host, rack, and star, right? We're adding a notion of a node group, which means, so instead of having just a three-layer topology, we'll add the fourth one. On the node itself, we can specify multiple virtual machines. So you can now, instead of doing host, rack, star, you can do VM, host, rack, star. So that's something we have on the roadmap, it's just not done. So again, comparing with the classic models. So, right. um, on the classic, uh, I produce, on the client side, the split is calculated. Correct. Right? Saved into its DFS, right. and when the job is submitted, the job tracker reads it and finds that many tasks, yeah. right? <laughs> right. So, reading the splits, number of splits, and creating that many tasks, which was done by the job tracker before, this it's is not done by, by the application master. Yeah, so it's done by the application master. So that reads that information and creates this resource request. Exactly. The resource control. Exactly. Okay. So it uses the input format. Says get splits, creates mm -hmm. the splits, look at looks at the split locations, right from HDFS. It gives you the host names, then it translates that to resource request. So here, when we say resource name, uh, and is it part? Is it like I want this many containers on this machine because I know that exactly. this data is in this machine? Yes. Right? So resource name is either host, rack, okay. host name, rack name, or star, which means I don't care. Okay. Like for red users, we say star, okay. right? Because we don't right. do. Okay. Yeah. Would it be appropriate to have racks with different specs of hardware? So absolutely. So one rack with high CPUs, another with yeah. more disk. Yep. And all of all of that is automatically handled, right? So when a node comes in and registers, it says I have this much CPU, this much RAM, this much disk, right? And that's used by the resource manager, and it can schedule across heterogeneous nodes. So that's been built in from day one. So if you can have different, if you want different kinds of hardware, um, it auto automatically works out of the box. Usually we see that happen because people buy different generations of hardware at different points in time, right? This year you buy some hardware, you know, six months from now you don't you don't pay you don't pay Dell the same amount of money to buy the same hardware. You get better hardware, right? So you get all of that automatically. What about more on the extreme end of things, like having a like, you know, colder archive that you're not touching that's just real disk heavy and then you know hotter analytic high performance? You could do that. I mean, one of the things we'll see definitely is um, as part of the resource request. Like I said, we have. Uh, resource capability, we have um, memory and disk, right? memory and CPU. One of the things we, uh, like we talked about in the afternoon, we want to add things like GPUs. You can have different nodes with you know, GPUs, for example, and then you can schedule based on that. So that's still a heterogeneous node. Um, we just specify, we just schedule based on different aspects. Does that answer your question? Yep. As an application writer, do I uh, take care of uh, one time installations? No, like I said, um, I'll talk a little bit more about it in the next slide. You usually put your code on HDFS. You don't install it on the node. So that install on the node is automatically done by Yarn. Well, yeah, if it's outside of something that Yarn can install, yeah. I mean, it's Zookeeper or whatever. I mean, you can still write an application master to install 0MQ. In fact, somebody um, just wrote an application master, I think it was Joe, to install, um, um, I forget, Memcache. So, there, there are different things you can do with it. Um, I believe there's a patch, so we should be able to get it done. Um, I think it was contributed with somebody from VMware, obviously, uh, makes sense for them. Um, it should get it in the next few months. I, I don't have a specific answer. Yeah. Okay. One more question. How, how, how does um, resource tracking like Ganglia and stuff start to change uh, in terms of monitoring performance? I mean, that now it seems like there's a lot of people that kind of right. obsess over utilization in various yeah. areas. And, and you still get all of that. I mean, Yarn still does Ganglia metrics, it does JMX. You can pick whatever uh, endpoint you want. 
Um, so it's either what JMix are, or, Med or Gecko. What are sort of the new, um, the new metrics, so to speak? I mean, I know more locally at the CPU level, but sort of the higher level metrics of. Um, it's things like we aggregate it per queue, so you get like queue level, you know, metrics. Um, so I like right probably can give you a better answer. People would look and see, you know, um, how many map tests versus reduce tests are we creating, right. and where are we at in terms of levels. Yeah, completely goes out the window. That goes out the window because you you only see containers at this point, right? So that's really the most relevant unit of measure. Yeah. Yeah, well, you still get containers and utilization and CPU graphs and disk IO graphs and so on. Anything else after that, you'd have to kind of yeah. build your own. Yeah. Um, so, just you know, like I said, I just want to show this the table because it shows that you're now getting um, two different resource requests and two different priorities. All right. So, typically, that's how we do in the map reduce case. We have map dust and reduce dust. So you have priority zero and priority one. Right. Um, let's see. Slow up. Hopefully, you got some more time. How are, we, how are we doing in time? It's up to you. As long as people are here, you can keep talking. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so the, the next one is container. So now the application master has done a bunch of research requests. Uh, what do you get back? You get a container, right? Now, like I said, containers are basically an allocation, but specifically what you get out of the container object that you get back from the resource manager is you get a container ID that's unique, right? You get a resource name, which means that is the node or node. It's, now it's the node specifically. It's no longer a rack. It is the node on which the container got allocated, right? And then there's capability. That's exactly what you asked for, right? If you ask for two gigs, you get back a capability that says two gigs, right? And the last one's really important. That's a token, right? Now this token is something we use whether we're running secure Hadoop or not, right? Because this token is what the node manager uses to validate that you actually got a container from the resource manager. So you can't go to the node manager and fake and say, I got a container from the resource manager. Because what's happening, whether it's secure or not, is that the node manager and the resource manager, they have a shared secret key, which is between every pair of hosts, resource manager and every node manager. So there are n keys if you have n node managers. And then the entire container, specifically the resource name, the container ID, and the capability are signed into the token using the shared key between the node manager and the resource manager. Which means if you take this container and present it to a wrong node, the node can't even decrypt because he doesn't have the secret key. So he's going to reject the container launch. He says, you're giving me a container I have no idea about. Either that or you're being malicious, right? So all that is built in into Yarn. Uh, so, so you have extremely fine-grained security built into it. You won't have you know, you know, people faking stuff. So, so right now, with HDFS, um, there's a lot of hesitation between PCI and PRI. So do you think one of the supporters can solve that problem? Yeah, I mean, we've always, we've already have like, you know, um, strong authentication with Kerberos uh, for a while. You'll see us, uh, you know, in a different context, put things like encryption and so on. That's one of the reasons Falcon's really important. Falcon provides you some of that. But that's all outside the realm of Yarn itself, right? Here, this is just security for your tokens. Um, so container launch context, uh, like I said, that's the actual spec for launching this process, right? So basically, the, the AM gets the container object. He now has to construct a container launch context where you see the container as one of the fields, right? So you have to present it unmodified to the node manager, right? And then he adds command, which is the Unix command you want to hold. He adds environment, which is basically key value pairs, exactly like you specify in Unix. And then you add local resources, which, like I said, is just a URI and type. Uh, which basically points to where the HTFS, where in HTFS the code is. Right? We have support for different types like uh, archives and tars and zip files and just bare basic files. Right? So if you have a zip file, we can actually download it, unzip it for you, so that after we unzip it, you have a full environment. You can similarly, you can do it for, the, for a tar ball or whatever. So instead of putting a million files on HTFS, we can just literally take, um, you know, my favorite example is take protocol buffers or PGZ. Put it in HDFS, it'll download it, untar it, and it'll it. Right? So we try to make it really easy for the application developer to actually um, use stuff. So, so if you have to run three tasks on a node, right. it's one replace, uh, let's say, two gig memory. Is it one container request for six or three, three containers? Three, right? Three containers, you have to do three container launch requests. Okay. Right? Um, 
let's see. Uh, we talk about the app master is per application. We think of it as the container zero. So you, you see us, hear us talk about it as container zero. Uh, like I said, this is the, he's the child of the resource manager. We talked about the parent-child relationship. Um, and like I said, the code for the application is submitted with the application. So what, the, what I mean by that is when the, when the client submits an application, you have to fill in the container submission co app submission context. It's got a resource request, container launch context, name, and queue, and so on. Right? So it's recursive. Right? You take the same container launch request, uh, container launch context, provide for the AM. You provide a resource request for the AM itself, um, and an app name and a queue name. Now, queue name is important because this is what we use. You cannot submit to all queues. We have actors on queues. So you can't go submit to random queues for generally. You can set up actors as the admin and say, only, only Arun can submit to this queue. And Arun cannot submit to any other queue. Right? You get fine grained apples. So again, it's all stuff borrowed from you know grid engine or, or lots of things like that. Um, I'm gonna run through this because I got a lot more slides. Um, in terms of the API, um, this is what you get. Um, we've got both synchronous and asynchronous version of the API. So based on you know what you feel like, you can use different APIs. So, if you're um, if you're a client, you basically have to make two calls. The one at the top, so you see the client in the RM. You have to say create application followed by submit application. Right? Those are the two things you have to do as the client. Um, so the first one gives the application ID. Yeah. And then this source resources against that application. Exactly. You first get an application ID back, and then you have to create an application submission context with that ID and then submit it back. Um, so we've got, like I said, both sync and a sync version. This is the uh, sync version of it. Um, now the resource allocation. Resource allocation between the AM and the RM is basically three steps. One is, the first one is you have to register. That means the AM is coming up and saying, I'm all done, I'm ready to go, right? The last one, he has to do an unregister saying, I'm complete. And in between, you can do allocate talks. There's an API called amrnclient.allocate, where you basically pass in resource requests. Right? And on the same call, you can actually get resources back, or containers back. Right? It's, it's three APIs. Right? Um, I'll rush through a little bit of this. So let's see, synchronous version, and you also have an async version. Now, the difference between the sync and the async version is the synchronous version, obviously, is a blocking call. In the async, you can, you can basically register a callback handle. And make the calls, and the callback handle, which is the client library, will notify you when containers available. So, depending on what what API you like, you can use either of them. So, you got callbacks like on container allocated, on container completed, on node failed, and so on and so on. So, you get all these callbacks. You can um, using resources is trivial. Um, you basically do a start container. When you get the container back, you, fill, you get the container from the RM. You fill in the container launch context. Right? And then you say am and client dot start container. Right? That's that's all the API is. Similarly, we have uh, start, stop, and get status. You can also do an async version of the same. Right? Start container, async, stop container, async. You can get back, you know, callbacks and uh, different uh, events. Right? So, um, just another. Quick detour, if you want to write your own applicant question. Yeah, can you go back to the previous slide? Mm -hmm. So this is communication from the application master to the node manager. To so launch the container. Yeah. Um, another one to remember is typically when you're writing your own application, um, you might want to debug first up. So we have this notion, we have this mode that you call an unmanaged application master. What this means is the application master is now running on your client rather than running in a container in the cluster. Now, this is nice when you're debugging because you can get STD out, step through a debugger, and so on and so on. Right? So instead of getting a random container on a node, you just have it running on your client. It's, it's in line with your code. Right? So you can now put it under a debugger or step through, you know, what have you, get STD out and STD out. So there's a unmanaging launcher that we were um, so if you want to like look look through an example, uh, I wrote possibly what's the simplest yarn app, um, which basically runs n copies of a Unix command, but 
I stripped down all the error handling, so it's easy for you to see what the hell is happening. Because typically, you know, error handling is like 80% of the code, right? It's on GitHub if, you, if you're interested. So basically what this does is, it's running that distributed shell, uh, that's the client, and you're running the command, which is bin date, and you're running n version of the, of the Unix command. Right? And so run n version of bin date and come back. So is there any application aspect for communication between Better performance. In fact, there isn't because there's no way for us to design one which is general enough, right? Because the, co the communication between the container and the AM is very app specific. Because we don't know what code you're going to run in the container, it's really hard for us to give you an API uh, because that code could be Perl or Python or Java or C++. So, so if you need to do any communication between the two or between multiple containers within that job, you have to write it yourself? You have to write it yourself. Oh, and the libraries which are all available. Sure. I mean, you can use a thrift client or right, whatever yeah, it is. Yeah, okay. But we can't, we can't specify the protocol. Uh, we can give you libraries, but we can't specify the protocol, which is an important part. Do you know what the MPI guys did? Uh, they used their existing one. Use MPI already yeah, talks to each other, right? Okay. Yep. So all they did with Yarn was basically this. this they launched, yeah, they launched, right they launched the MPI demons, right. and you're done. Right. Um, I'll, I'll but do you know how the uh, so? But for whatever number of processes they had in the MPI job, those will show those showed up as like different containers. Exactly. Right? Okay, so they had to because the container is allocated by the resource manager, right? So they had to somehow join those, right. join all the schedules that group dynamics. Exactly. Right? Uh, okay. okay. Yeah. Right. So they had to do what is typically called as wire up. Right, so it was like they had to do the wire. Join the groups. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. I, yeah. I, 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 so all they had to do was write the code yeah. to get the containers and yeah. wire them up yeah. and then go. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Right. So if so, the classic model again. So after the job is complete. I get a sense that you're really worried about the classic one. <laughs> well, <laughs> because it's more a comparison, right? So we want to switch from one to sure, other, so sure. we need to know the difference. Like I said, it's it's completely compatible. Don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, anyway, don't take my word so, for it. You can, you can play with it. Yeah, I'll always preface, preface mm -hmm. my question with classics. So I want yeah. to compare. So, yeah. um, so if I have, after the job is complete, um, currently we go to the job tracker, right. look at the logs. right? right? So in the new model, application master is more dynamic, right? It comes on the, right. when you run the job, it comes to the, Good question. it yeah. goes down. What happens so to the logs? Happens? Right. So the question is, what happens to the logs? Today it was all this with a job tracker. Mm -hmm. So all the really cool things we've, we've done in Yarn, um, and we had to do it anyway um, for different applications, is we've built in aggregation of the logs onto HDFS. So every time you run the job, all your logs for all your tasks get into HDFS automatically. So those logs are available forever on HDFS, and we provide a link that you can use to look at logs. And you can look at logs per container, per task, whatever you want. Right? So that, those logs are on HDFS forever. So you can actually, that's one of the things people always want with MapReduce. The problem with MapReduce was it's on a local machine. If the local machine died, you've lost it, right? Now that it's on HDFS, you probably have, to, you have the logs forever. It's really nice. So when you're reading about this yarn, right? So from the main job tracker, we go to the application master job tracker to look at the job history. Right. right. Now, now we that's have gone, a right? we have a history server. Okay. So we like go directly from the yeah. It's automatically redirected when okay. the application is done. It's automatically redirected. Yeah. All right. So I'll I'll quickly walk you through the code. Um, this is the client code, right? You see the line numbers there. Um, you basically create a client, create yarn client, line number two, init it with a config and start. And once you're done, you say create application. Right? That's when you create the application, the first call you saw in the two of them. Um, now, after you, you create application, you are basically setting up the app uh, context, app submission context. Right? So what you do here is setting up the commands for the application master. You, you set, you're literally setting the Unix command to launch the Java process for the AM. Right? You're saying Java home, uh, 256 megs of um, RAM, you know, heap size, blah, blah, blah. And you're setting, you're saying, oh, I want all these containers. And then you're saying, I want, for each of my containers, I want 256 megs of RAM and two cores of CPU. Right? So you're going ahead and submitting all this. All this code is available in GitHub, if you guys want to look at it. That's the URL. 
Um, it's, you can you know forfeit it later. So you set up the containers. You say, this is the application master. He's he's been told to run three containers, each with one core and 1024 megs of RAM, and um, he's running bin. What? I forget why I don't see it here. Anyway, oh, he's it's that code is in the AM, right? So that's the command line for the AM. He's going to take that code and translate it to it's resource request. Country. Yeah. Here it's three containers. The the application master is being told to run three containers here. Each container should have one core and you know, one gigabyte. Right? And now you're filling up the app submission context for the AM itself, right? You're saying that's my queue, that's my containers, the AM container spec, my resource for the AM container, my app name and type. Right? You set up all these fields, and then you just say submit. So by default, what Yarn does is it puts um, your present working directory in the class bar, PWD. And typically, when you, you when you specify a resource, I, I didn't show all the code here, but when you specify a job, that job will be put in your, in your, in your current working directory, right? In your PWD. So it's automatically part of the class bar. So how does an application developer decide how many containers to get. Like when I was writing a traditional map to job, based on the aggregation on this parsing, I would allocate number of map Right. Right. Um, well, I, frankly, I don't know. Right. You're the application master. You're writing an application. If you're writing Storm, you know something about it. If you're writing Giraffe, you know something about it. But we can't specify anything, you know, for you. We can't prescribe anything. Are there some guidelines? Well, I don't even know what you're doing with your application. So it's hard for me to give you a guideline <laughs> for something I have no idea about. But obviously, I can help. If you tell me what application you're building, I can help. But I can't decide it for you. I, I'm not trying to be glib, but I, I'm, I'm being honest. I just don't know what to do. Right? So you do that, and then like that's it. Right? Once you fill this up, you set up the application submission context for the AM. You just say submit, and you're done. So maybe rephrase a little differently. Um, is it better to go more cores to your containers or more containers to your cores? I know it depends, but. <laughs> <laughs> you know the answer. <laughs> it depends really on the application you're writing. If you're doing Storm, you probably want more uh, cores. If you're doing MapReduce, you want you know, better for fault tolerance, which means more tests. But, so, as a consumer of the application, how do you know what you Yeah, if you're, if, you're, if you're somebody who's writing MapReduce jobs with MapReduce users, you don't know what to get, right? The client library will take care of it for you. If you're just using Storm, you don't know our care. Storm will take it for you, take care of it for you, right? Um, so I'll quickly walk you through the AM code. Uh, it's a little more code. The first thing comes up, he creates two clients. One client to talk to the application master, and another client to talk to the node manager. There's two clients. And he registers the app master as line 30, right? That's the first step you saw. Um, and then now he starts making resource resource request, right, or at least sets it up. You basically say, I want three containers, right, or n, which is the number of containers which came up. I want one container request for each of these, right? There's an API called an add container request, right? Each container is setting, is saying, I want 128 megs of RAM and one, one, one port, right? Um, and now, once you set up the, app, you know, um, once you set up the, resource requests, he starts making the allocate calls, and he runs it in the loop, right? Until you get all the allocated containers, you keep running, and as soon as you get something, as soon as it gets a container, that's how you check, uh, response dot get allocated containers, as soon as it gets one, he's gonna launch it. Right, this code is just to launch the, create the container launch request, um, and launch bin date, which is the uh, application you want to run, right, or the code you want to run. And then this keeps going. Once he's got all the containers and launched them, he just waits for the containers to finish. Right, this loop is waiting for the containers to finish. Uh, get computer container statuses. Exit status equals zero means it's, you know, like Unix, it's, it's successfully completed. If it was non-zero, you, you have to do error handling. Right, it's exactly like Unix. I mean, you're doing, node manager is doing a fork and is reporting back the exit status. So if you're an application, you can say, 
minus 256 is 1, minus 31 is 1. You can pick. All the system does is, is that it will faithfully report it back to you. Right? I saw a question. In case of constant system, Say it again? In case of constantly running system, like stop, this loop will not finish. Yep. That loop will not finish. But you might still get failures. You still have to handle it. You still have to make the allocated calls and figure out if there are failures. On the same lines, if once I launch my application master for stop, then how do I interact with it? Still storm specific. It's storm specific at that point, right? So it's storm. We, we, I'll walk you through how storm works, but it's storm specific. There's a client. There's a protocol between the client and the storm master. <coughs> Any questions? Okay, so let's walk through. Uh, that was the you know writing an application. Uh, like I said, the code is available on GitHub if you want to walk through, uh, debug it, and so on. Um, now let's talk through some of the applications, right? So obviously the the first one we built was MapReduce. Right. We, we wanted to build a better system for MapReduce. Uh, it also was the most complex application to build. Right? Why was it complex? Because we had to solve a number of cases which you normally don't have to solve. Right? What are those? We had to do data locality. Um, that's really important for MapReduce to get good performance. Like I said, data locality drove a bunch of features into Yarn itself. Right? Um, that, that was important. Fault tolerance, if, you know, if the node fails, if a container fails, you have to handle all of that. The MapReduce application master handles it. Um, recovery, if the application master failed, we didn't want to read on the job. So we actually now have implemented a checkpoint system where the application master is checkpointing itself to HTFS. If the app master fails, the resource manager will start a new app master, right, a new avatar of the app master, and he will start recovering from the checkpoint. So he'll only start from where he left them. That's really cool. Uh, what, about the, what about the resource manager failure? Uh, is there like massive active? There's a, well, we're, we're in development right now. Um, next, next couple of months, we should have it done. But we'll have a zookeeper-based failover. Oh, okay. yeah. Similar to how we saw it with that's HDFS, cool. we'll actually use the same code, actually. That's same cool. zookeeper <laughs> controller <laughs> failover. Especially the tokens. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, we had to build in, like I said, intra-application intra priorities. Uh, again, that was specific for MapReduce. Obviously, other applications can use them now. Uh, we had to do security and isolation and all of these. Security was we had to be at least as good as Hadoop 1, uh, curve rows and all that stuff, LDAP. Uh, in fact, we're now better because it, this will have integration with things like Knox. Uh, Knox is a new project we're working on for parameter security. That's going to get integrated with Yarn too. Right? Isolation, uh, we built in C groups from day one. So all the containers we launch are, are in their own C group. Um, I, sh I should have mentioned, but I didn't. Uh, Yarn works both on Linux and Windows. So if you're running on Linux, you're using C groups for isolation. If you're running on Windows, you use Windows specific APIs. Uh, it's called Job Control for Windows specific isolation. So it's based on the actual operating system we run on. Um, and Yarn does it automatically for you. So, uh, like I said, the most important one is um, binary compatible with MapReduce. That uh, goes back to your classic concern. It just works. If it doesn't work, you can give me a call. I'll fix it. <laughs> Fast, really fast. Uh, so that's how you know, like I said, MapReduce looks. You run hundreds of MapReduce applications. You'll, all of them will get their own application master. They're running on different nodes. Um, now, on the more interesting ones, um, there is something I, I mentioned in passing. Um, how many here have, have heard of Dryer? Right. So you can think of this as basically Dryer. Now, what Dryer is is it was really interesting research paper from Microsoft, and they actually productionized it in a, in a framework they called uh, Cosmos, right? It's running inside Microsoft today. Um, so what, what the drive paper said was you can, you can come up with a more complex abstraction rather than MapReduce, because that will really solve the, um, you know, sort of the SQL slash pig slash data flow slash cascading on to do, right? Now, what is that? If you look at a complex query like that, which I have, which got a select and a union and a couple of group bytes, map, because MapReduce only offers a single aggregation, it just maps reduce, maps and reduce, right? For, to run that query, we have to run four MapReduce jobs, right? I don't know if you can see the circle, but each of these are, each of these circles here are MapReduce jobs, 
right? To run that one hype query, we've run four MapReduce jobs. Now, this why is this bad? Because in between your MapReduce jobs, we have to persist the intermediate output to disk. And it's worse than disk because it's actually HDFS, which means we have to write three replicas to be really reliable, right? So there's the I.O. overhead of the synchronization barrier between the jobs. And we also have the overhead of you know, latencies, right? This is not just one job, you have to submit four jobs. Each of them will go to the end of the queue. You know, latency suffers. So what we've done with this is to support a significantly more complex uh, graph processing or DAG processing engine, right? So now with this, you can run a single job, right, which can do a significantly, a series of significantly complex DAGs, all as one, right? And it's obvious why this is more efficient because now we're not going to HDFS other than the initial input and final load. We, we went further than that and said, in between, you see all these edges, right? These edges can actually go directly through memory or through a socket, um, and it doesn't have to even persist on the local disk. So the DAG is processed by one node? No, it's processed across the cluster. So think of this as a more complex map reduce job, right? So you have maps running different places, reduce running different places. We've got different multiple aggregations running on different nodes. Right, so this is distributed and it's running on a cluster, but it's just a more complex DAG to manage. So I, you know, I talked about how the MapReduce engine was the most complex one I wrote. Scratch that. This is ten times harder, right? Because this is significantly more complex DAG. Because the problem here is failure handling. Right? If somebody here fails, I might have to go all the way back and some, start somebody at the top of my tree. Right, so handling that error error case is actually really hard, and that's one of the reasons why this is more complex, more complex than that use. Right, and the other one is you want even more levels of priority here. Right, this is like five or six different levels of priority. In map reduce, it's all this just two maps. And users. Right, um, there's a bunch of complications with handling that, but overall, like I said, this is much more efficient than map reduce for both things, right? It's really, really fast for small queries because we can stream everything to uh, RAM or, or to a socket. It's also really, really good for large queries because you're not persisting you know, terabytes of high, you know, uh, output to HDFS, right? So it's really cool because you can solve both ends of the problem with one sort of engine, right? And even better part is, obviously this is now not restricted to hype, right? I've given a query here for hype, but it's general for, it's the same for pig or cascading or whatever, right? So what this means is we've gone from that stack, which you see in Hadoop 1, to this stack in Hadoop 2, right? We've got HDFS, MapReduce, pig, and hive on top. Here we've got HDFS, yarn, Taze, and now MapReduce, pig, and hive, so they all compile down to Taze itself. Right, so this actually replaces MapReduce at the bottom of the stack. Because since it can handle a complex, arbitrarily complex DAG, it can obviously handle MapReduce, right? So now MapReduce and Pig, instead of having a dependency relationship, they become peers, right? And that's really um, cool. Any question on this? Yes. <coughs> you you can. We have it today, uh, but we're going to throw it away at some point. We have the MapReduce application master and the Thayer's application master today, uh, but you know, give us six months, twelve months, it's going to go away. So, it, it doesn't run a MapReduce, right? No. Is it similar to Impala? Or? Better, because this can handle not just small queries, but not just small queries fast. It can handle large queries which don't fit into RAM, okay. and it can do fault tolerance. It can recover from errors, all that stuff. This one keeps everything in memory, right? No, not necessarily. It, it it automatically deals with uh, different kinds of data. The application master can understand how much data you're processing, and he either spills it to disk, or he streams it to uh, sockets. So there is no restriction, like yeah. Impala, that one side of the table should no, be no, less. No, absolutely. <laughs> That's really important for us. And also, because we can, we can run large queries, uh, we have to do fault tolerance, which means Unlike Impala, if a query fails, we don't expect the user to run from scratch. Here we'll deal it, like in MapReduce. If map fails, we'll run it from, from better left over. Right? But here, if something here fails, we, are, we might have to go all the way back and start it. So why do I need MapReduce if this is always faster? 
um, it depends. This API is actually really complex. If you thought MapReduce was not easy, this is 10 times harder because this is a really low level API. We don't expect end users to use this API. But, but still, it is so the, the previous diagram, right? So uh, even the MapReduce part was going through the. Teams. It will, but you won't see a difference if you're just running MapReduce. You'll get the same performance characteristics if you get with MapReduce. Except that for small queries, it'll be a little faster. I mean, we can't improve MapReduce much more okay. um, because it's the simplest of DAX. The key is, in fact, okay. so it depends on your query. So just to, just to clarify, so Kenny's doesn't turn the complex simple into a bunch of MapReduce. Exactly. If there's some rollout of stuff that it does, that it's a bunch of MapReduce. Well, it's, it's slightly more nuanced than that in the and sense how, that. How does backtrack Right, it's actually not Tez doing it, it's Hive doing it. So Thais offers these primitives. Okay. Thais, we, we fixed Hive to compile down to Thais rather than MapReduce, right? So it's actually, we have to go change Hive to do this. And, and we change, we're also changing Pick to do this. So simultaneously, both Pick and Hive become faster because they're using a more complex but much more efficient uh, primitive. So like I said, this really replaces MapReduce in the, in the big data stack. Right, um, and that's really cool. In fact, I mean, this is stuff you know, you know, go back three years ago. There were hundreds of papers being written. I, I was, you know, I, I call it a cottage industry to write papers saying SQL and MapReduce sucks. I'm like, yeah, that's true. Everybody knows, you know, this is really bad, right? But we couldn't implement this until we had yarn. So it was a, <laughs> it was a, you know, chicken and egg problem. We had to go fix, you know, MapReduce to be more general, which was yarn, before we built something other than MapReduce, right? Because now I can de-risk it. Because MapReduce, like I said, still works and is still available, but I can simultaneously, you know, have another engine which is better, faster than MapReduce. Uh, but you know, depending on the configuration, Hive can either do MapReduce or Thais. For a while, it'll still do MapReduce, but you know, six months from now, it'll do Thais all the time. Right? So we can do this that way. I saw some other questions. Um, so Uzi, there's no change. So Uzi still can, submits a Hive query, right? Automatically under the hood, Hive, Hive will generate a Thais job instead of five MapReduce jobs. So Uzi, no, as the end user does not care, right? So it's all transparent to the end user, right? Uh, so this uh, green uh, nodes, it's actually uh, red users. By, 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 uh, by nature, I mean, in some, not, not green this node, but something else. By by nature, it's something like my produce jobs, which takes key value pairs and, and sends out key value pairs, right? This model still yeah restriction. So it's only this model served, right? So we don't actually restrict this to key value pairs. <coughs> uh, this can actually do more than map reduce. Mm -hmm. So map reduce is restricted to key value pairs. Mm -hmm. Under the hood, this is not restricted to map reduce. So what nature of this intermediate nodes so then? Um, for, for now, it's still key value pairs, mm -hmm. uh, but over time, we'll actually make that different. Okay, <clears throat> now, uh, another question. <clears throat> so, normally, in, in the current model, you know that mapper actually has the spill, spill files, is buffer, and write to files, read files, merge, write to right. files. So, all these things mm, still could be here? Or exactly. We, so, this does exactly that for MapReduce. Because you said that you, you don't uh, write to HDFS, but mappers write to HDFS all the time. Not only during shuffling, but even before that. So, what about so mappers don't write to HDFS today. Mm -hmm. They only write to the local disk. Yeah, yeah, right, local disk, right. Local disk. This, oh. will, this guy, this map of here, will still write to local disk if uh -huh. he needs to. Oh. But if he doesn't have to, he won't. Oh, okay. Because he can look at the amount of data coming out. Mm -hmm. So for small <coughs> files, it, it will just run. Stream to socket, yeah. And is it also configurable thing, or? Uh, well, it's both configurable and dynamic. So the app master is actually watching each of these guys, and he's giving him dynam uh, directions at runtime to say, you should not spill to disk because you're small. Mm -hmm. um, and some of the smarts are built into the task itself. So I can't give you a straight answer because that's split over a number of uh, aspects. I mean, it starts all the way with Hive, right? So Hive is a bunch of table stacks, which it uses to drive a first level configuration for this guy. Then at runtime, he uses that as a hint to do even more Optimizes the runtime, so there, 
there are three or four levels of optimizations happening. One at query planning time, one at query runtime, and one at the task runtime. So it's three levels of optimization. Okay. And, and who actually put, how Envision, other system, etc., Pig and Hive and MapReduce itself also will be using this test model, or, or, it's only, or it will be black box for other uh, applications? Um, so we'll talk, I mean, I, unfortunately I can't share more now, but we've talked, we're working with a number of other vendors, proprietary software vendors, to actually port their applications to this. Um, I can only talk about it when it's public, mm -hmm. and that's a little way away, but you'll see you, a lot of people come out and say we're now integrating with this and sort of map reduce. Uh, so for the classic map reduce, uh, between map Right. For that, no, it's not. Like that. Exactly. Yeah. And now, uh, will, will there be something like REST or TRIP APIs kind of things which any application can use through? So, the answer is no because I don't want to provide it. I don't want end users to use this. I want them to use high work pick. Um, so, if you really want to use this, you really know what you're doing. At that point, you're, you're using a Java API. <laughs> so, for the end user, when he goes through the map reduce or Hive pig or, or pig. Hive, still there is no difference. Exactly. Internally, there is a more two. It's a different. It's a different compilation. Different yeah, it's like cross compiling to a different architecture. So, the the current state is it something we can control through a switch or configuration to say, I want this or I don't want this. Right. So I'm going to run out of time. Um, let me quickly walk you through a couple more things. So that's this. So you got a Thais AM and a map reduce AM running in the same cluster, which is time zero now. Hoya um, is edge based on Yarn. Um, so some of the use cases for edge based um, in Hoya is, uh, okay, let's step back. It's a way for us to deploy edge based using Yarn. Right, so you now we get common resource management across edge based and, and MapReduce and this and Storm and all of that stuff, right? You don't have to go physically set it up yourself. Uh, some of the use cases are small edge based cluster and a large Yarn cluster. Uh, dynamic edge based clusters, you bring them up and down. Um, and the last one which I really like is transient clusters. What this means is, Along with your ETL workflow, you can decide programmatically to bring up an edge based cluster, use it only for your Uzi workflow, shut it down. That's really cool because you might want a key value store in between only for a short time, right? So Hoya actually provides Java APIs to create edge based clusters. So you could go with Elastic, huh? Exactly. Right? Um, it can flex cluster size uh, based on load, you can get more and less. And if a region server fails, the Hoya application master will get a container on the data node, which is local for the rest of data, and get better MTR, MTTR, right? Um, I believe we're gonna get kicked out in two minutes. Uh, that's how it looks like. We got a Hoya AM, but the key to remember is that we didn't touch edge base at all. So what it means is that now the Hoya AM can actually run multiple versions of edge base, 94, 96, 95, all in the same cluster, right? It's all application level, so that's really cool. Um, oh, let's go to Storm and Yarn, right? That's hopefully my last one, I believe. So Storm and Yarn, uh, obviously the primary contributor is Yahoo. They're running in production for a few months now, 200 plus nodes in production just on Storm, on top of the Yarn. Um, some of the cool stuff they've built is um, a recovery from faulty nodes. So if one of the Storm nodes goes away, it'll get another one by going to RM. The other one is auto-scaling, which means, you know, they set a, a, a limit of, let's say, 10,000 events per container. Right for storm container. If suddenly you get a burst of new events uh, for whatever reason, the Hoya, the storm AM is watching, and it'll actually get you a new container to handle that peak load. And then when it's done, it'll you know give it away. Right, so it can automatically and gracefully handle. If you want to look at the code, it's on the GitHub Yahoo Storm Yarn. Uh, actually, storm as of last week it was is getting into the Apache incubator. Uh, so hopefully all of this code will get merged in and put in the ASF2, right? So again, um, the way this works is you got a Storm AM, we didn't touch Storm. We now go, the Storm AM will go deploy the Nimbus events, which is what we get in Storm, and then run and you're good to go. So we don't have to touch Storm. So you can now again, like I said, run multiple versions of Storm if you want, right? Any questions on Storm? Exactly. Yep. Automatically set. Yeah. You don't, not, nothing changes the way you do Storm. And what's one of the key architectural decisions was don't touch HPS, don't touch Storm. 
let them handle what they're already handling. Just deal with the resource management aspect. All right. So let me wrap up. I don't think we've got time to talk through these. Um, if you want more resources about these, uh, obviously I did the 2.1 beta release uh, a week and a half ago. We also did the HTTP2 beta release uh, last week. Uh, there's a bunch more information about all the stuff we talked about in the blogs if you guys want. I'll share these uh, slides so you should be able to get them. Uh, shameless plug, I'm writing a book. Uh, <laughs> um, so that's gonna come out hopefully uh, early part of last year. We're also doing a beta program for partners. So we've got a number of people porting their application, Microsoft, Elasticsearch, um, Splunk, all these guys. So we help them port their applications to Spawn. We've got like office hours, we do in our Palo Alto office. Uh, you guys are welcome to join remotely. Only if you're ready to do your own applications, not for classic. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so this is if you're writing new application, we can help uh, you know, sort of design it for you, point out issues and so on. Um, and more information, Harden works to do PR. Um, that's it. Hopefully that was useful. Any, any last questions? Is the book available at that? Uh, uh, we, there's, the book isn't complete. <laughs> All right, that's, turns out writing book is much harder than writing book. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that's going to take a total speed time. It's funny because every time I write the I write a chapter of go we write it two months from now yeah. because the change. You see, guys, we have about a half hour to kick us out of the room. So oh, okay, cool. Yeah, so if we want to just make old talk, you know, ask questions. Yeah, okay, cool. Any? So my quick question is uh, machine learning applications. So, that's not so um, the couple of options um, R, if you're familiar with R, yeah. uh, works in uh, Yarn. Say it again. That's R is the language. Yeah, it's the language. yeah that, that works in Hadoop. Uh, so there's R, Hadoop, RMR, all those things can do the work. Um, you'll see, like I said, other software vendors make announcements. I don't want to steal the thunder. Um, there's also Spark, which works on the yarn. So you've got lots of options. I don't have a prescription to make, but you can have different applications. I don't know if I answered your question. Yeah, okay. yeah. So, so right now, there are some web applications. If they want to interact with some data in HTFS, they either use web HTFS, right. or if they want to make some queries, it's a very cool way they actually use the Flipgrid API to get some data. So from what I got from one of your slides was use the right hype. If they're actually getting some data on doing what. Yeah, yeah. Use hype, exactly. Hype, yeah. Which is uh, we going to use these. Exactly. So it's our responsibility to make Hive better. Okay. Uh, so we keep doing that. So you, you sort of keep reaping the benefits over time. Instead of trying to do something ad hoc for now and then you know, sort of try to go back to Hive later. Uh, in my experience, open source software gets so fast, so fast that it's sort of not worth trying to compete, to compete with the community and do something else. You're better off sort of working with the community. In fact, you know, obviously, you're more than welcome to help fix Hive. Hive so. <laughs> so then I'm trying to build something like that. Right. So with the Hive being so popular now, and I think it's going to be used for the data warehousing and all that, how would people try to do the data modeling? I mean, obviously, you won't want to do a lot of star schemas type of things. Sure. In the, right? So are there anybody in coming in with a Books or recommendations on how and so what we will do is we'll try and make every existing data warehouse book work with Hive. So you don't have to learn new things. Rather we'll fix Hive to you know do stuff which people expect already. Right. Rather than trying to force people to learn new stuff, it's easier for us to just fix Hive to you know work as people expect. So everything that you know about your warehouse, your Ralph Kimball books should all you know work with Hive. Last question, so how, um, in your stack, um, what's the part of data management? Uh, that's, it's, it's called edge, edge catalog. Okay. Edge catalog is a stack that you, you use. Uh, so it's a replacement for the Hive metadata server. The nice part about edge cat, it's part of Hive, by the way. Uh, it's part of, nice part about edge cat is you can use edge cat from MapReduce or Pig or Hive or any other language, even Cascade. It's edge catalog. I forget what is in your again. I see. I hear something. Why do I have it better than most? I don't know. You should tell me. Find out. Well, 
<laughs> not trying to be glib. But right. I, I know I, that. Uh, the point I'm, I'm trying to make is that five years ago, I right. was using some engines to do a lot of things that I know we are using. Sure. I mean, you're right. I mean, there are a lot. I mean, we're not. Um, we're, I mean, there's a lot of research which has gone on here, right? So there's some parts which are new. Things like resource map. Some of the resource request stuff is new. Some of the details we have under the hood, specifically for map views, is new. Um, it's a. I can spend another five hours talking about why we, why we put some features in Yarn, and by without those features in Yarn, map views would completely suck. Oh, that's you know sort of in the weeds down there, um, but like I said, the sort of the thirty thousand feet view is all the data is going to line up in HDFS, um, and Yarn is Hadoop. So if you deploy Hadoop, you're going to get HDFS and Yarn, right? So then the sort of the mousetrap is you already have Hadoop, you already have Yarn. Why don't you use it? Right? And that's going to be a simple answer for a lot of people. Um, obviously, MapReduce still works. It's still the best engine to run MapReduce, by far. Um, and then we go, you're going to get even more value with things like Tez um, and Hoya and all of these things. So I don't have a really good answer about why it's better than SunGrid engine, except that you know it's Hadoop. Uh, it's got a lot of gravity right now. And obviously, we as a vendor are trying to you know, take advantage of that. Um, but that's the reality. I mean, it's got a lot of gravity, and that's going to be um, much, you know, it's going to be real. And we also tested it to a, to a point. I don't know what scale SunGrid engine ever ran, uh, but I'm, I don't know if it ran on thirty-five thousand dollars. Yeah, that's your point. It's owned by all. Yeah. Oh, I see. So there is also another initiative, right? Sorry, I, I mean, I, I thought you were just, yeah. Uh, could you talk about how Yarn can uh, eliminate like, all of the, yeah. Like, I mean, you actually put that uh, from Yahoo context, does it mean that uh, the cluster, the yeah. lithium blue, and the lithium red are the same cluster then? No, no. We are Yahoo? Yeah. Okay. I was. Oh, okay. <laughs> we should switch off the, okay, but anyway. Um, so the gold cluster is no yeah. longer on. So gold is gone. So mithril, the lithium, gold are all gone. So that's how. But they already got much more than on the existing clusters. So they, they could throw away 10,000 nodes, but still not hurt their end applications. But then, but then how does Yarn enable the, the, the elimination of gold? Because Yarn is much more efficient. Like I said, people are now, Yahoo is running 150K jobs per day rather than 70K jobs per day. It's 2x better on the same hardware. So you got so much better utilization that Yahoo will probably be fine even if they throw away another 10,000 dollars. That's not going to happen because you know, obviously the demand has gone up, but you know, that's the value we get with Yahoo. Yeah. Do you have an initiative called Steel, right? So that today is a part of Stinger. Yeah, part of Stinger. Yeah. What, what, what is Stinger other than? Um, that's another three hours of conversation. <laughs> but uh, we're improving Hive a lot. Uh, obviously, one is, the big one is Tails. One big one is Tails. The other one is we're building things like uh, a cost-based optimizer. We're, we're building a, um, a, there's something we, we work on called vectorization. Uh, vectorization is how you do fast query processing with current modern hardware. Uh, what I mean by that is in a modern CPU, on a single clock cycle, I don't know if you're familiar with our hardware architectures, or on a single clock cycle, you can now it, it, execute the entire CPU pipeline. Right? That's 20, 50. Uh, uh, instructions based on how, how much you paid Intel and how deep your pipeline is. So with uh, what it, we are, we're taking advantage of that with Hive. Uh, we have to do a bunch of work in Hive to take advantage of that. Primarily, it comes back to database architecture. Databases uh, historically process one row by one. So they say get next, get next, get next. You get one row at a time. If you do that with a modern CPU, it's really slow because you're not giving enough work on the pipeline. So you're, giving only, you're putting only one instruction on the pipeline, right? So with vectorization, we put a thousand instructions in the pipeline and let the CPU deal with it. Okay. And we 
like we built an early prototype with which we processed 100 million rows per second on my desktop. Is that so that's part of the point that's part one, of one, point one one? It's not in part one. It's sort of come in point one three. One thing I noticed is when I was doing my test in just, just one second. I, I want to make sure that you you got what is yes, what is. So that's vectorized query processing that's changing hype. In addition to doing this, we are using vectorized query processing with hype. So, so I get all these benefits only if I use hype. Yes. Okay. We're fixing hype. Big. So that's well, at some point we'll fix big too. Okay. Uh, but you know, obviously the the you know most of the enterprise want SQL. So we'll definitely SQL engine or whatever. But over time, the benefits of vectorization will come to the speak also. <coughs> The, the vectorization itself is based on SIMD and Java 8, right? So question is, for a late uh, version of Java 7, when, when, do you have a gut for when Hortonworks is going to support Java 7, Java 8? So, the, so to clarify, vectorization works irrespective of what Java version you have. Isn't it dependent on a lot of the SIMD stuff in Java 8? Well, it definitely gets better with every release. Uh, since we are on the JVM, we just rely, the, we rely on the hotspot VM to take advantage of it. Right. Seven gets better. Eight gets even better. Right. Um, so I, I can, I can go check. Um, I believe we are very close to supporting Java Seven. Okay. Uh, so that should work. Yeah, because they said that a lot of that work is going to be backported to a late version of Java Seven. The the same. The same stuff. stuff. Yeah. yeah. So what it means is that the hotspot VM is getting better. That's right. Of course. Right. Uh, but even before we rely on the hotspot VM, we had to fix a lot of, well, of Java-specific stuff, sure. which we had to do with vectorization. So I mean, that's one of the reasons we didn't I do think it. that Hadoop tried this platform works on pretty many, on pretty many client side on Java 7 already. Yeah, it, it sort of, it, it mostly works. Uh, I know a lot of people using it, but we haven't certified it yet as far as it works. I don't think any of the other vendors have either. So we will, I mean, it's close. Um, the other one for Singer is we, we invent, we are, we worked on a new file format, it's called ORC. ORC is much more efficient than RC file, uh, like orders of magnitude more efficient. It's, mu it's much more compressible, it uses native types and sort of Java types, and that was again one of the reasons we had to do vectorization. Well, it's one of the things we had to do for vectorization. So we had to use native types and sort of Java types. So the reason is, if you use Java types, you send an array of point objects in capital INT to the CPU, it's basically a pointer, right? So your L1 cache ref reference, locality of reference gets shot. So instead of sending a in capital integer, array of capital integer, we now send an array of small int, which is coming all the way from the file format. So that we have to do ORC. So it's way more efficient because it's tighter packed. And we get something like, uh, in several cases, we've got like 1,000x compression with ORC. It depends on the query. Any thoughts on user dependent indexes on the ORC? Uh, we've got thoughts. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, yeah, yeah. but yeah, it's, it's definitely, something that, uh, we're definitely on the way to do that. Right, it's part of our work now. There's a lot of useful it's things that you can do if you can. Yeah. Well, one of the things is primarily Hive doesn't have a primary key to it. Right, right. So we're going to go fix Hive. It's like right. start all the way from there. Uh, go fix Hive without a primary key. You know, it, it would be really good if the ORC stuff was sort of slightly decoupled from Hive. Right now, it falls into the Hive packaging. And it would be good if, if some other applications could use that without bringing the hive dependency. So you can already do that if you go through EdgeCat. Okay. If you go through EdgeCat, you can already use it from Pig and Hive and Map. Right, sorry, Pig and MapReduce. Right. And you, so you still have the dependency. But the problem, one of the reasons we did it in Hive was we had to follow the Hive types. That's right. And without following the Hive types, we would not get the efficiency. Right. So we don't want to convert at all. Right. I mean, we don't want to convert from one type to another. It it's absolutely really good to have it as a completely standalone package. So if I wanted to, like, sort of sure. settle on ORC yeah. as my own HDFS REST format, right? you can do that already. Like I said, if you go through EdgeCap, so you can already use ORC in Pig or MapReduce directly if you use EdgeCap. So in SAP Hana, they're talking about the memory processing. Right. So anything you So we announced a big partnership with SAP SAP today. Um, I can't talk about specifics yet, but in, in the next uh, few weeks, you'll oh, see us okay. talk more about it. So in-memory processing. Yes, so we definitely have an integration with Hadoop is on the roadmap. Yeah. I don't want to spill the beans yet. <laughs> do, do you know if anybody is supporting like any kind of MDX queries? MDX, um, I'm sure we will at some point. Okay. Yeah, um, MDX on uh, Hive okay. should, should easily work. MDX, most MDX engines will translate down to right, SQL. SQL right? yeah. um, 
One of the things we've done with uh, Stinger um, is uh, put a lot more SQL in Hive. So we've got things like windowing functions, right. proceeding rows, which is really important for MDS. Right, right, right. right. right? right. So all the, our windowing and proceeding right. and rows proceeding and lagging and so on. Right. Uh, MDX can get, take advantage. We already have the the base functionality. All they need now to do is like integrate with the driver. So it is in the plan. It's in the plan. Yeah. yeah. So just one more question. Compare to have you compared this with like Pala and Drill? Drill, I can't because I haven't seen it. I don't know if anybody has. Uh, in Pala, for a lot of queries, we're already faster than Pala. It depends on the query. If it's a simple query, we're doing a select star. Who cares? But if you're doing a complex join, which is what most, you know. Warehouses actually do, uh, we're already faster. And also, we can handle things at scale. Right? So, you don't have to go to Impala for X query and Hive for another query. It's still one system. You can do all of it in Hive. So, we're very confident we're uh, at least as good as not better. Any questions? Yeah, so one thing I was saying before is that uh -huh. observed in the Hive versus Pig, there's a huge amount of difference. When I was doing a billion record join with a out on the table, I was getting five hour time on a six node cluster for a pig. For the same process, when I do it in Hive, I was getting five times faster. W what version of Hive are you using? Hive 1.1. One, one. Yeah. So we've been it's fixing like Hive because of the, because of the Stinger work. work. Yeah. Right. So we've done a lot of work in Hive recently. Unfortunately, that hasn't gone into pig yet. It will, it's on. Because so far I was doing thinking about ETL means we should only do pig, but you know, when pig has such a disadvantage compared, but I think well, I'm hoping a, with Taze yeah, being it's a, a platform thing. for both I mean, of them. It, it's that it's basically a question of what we focus on. So, so at this point, we focus on Hive. That's going to change next year. Uh, once we, we're, we're close to saying, oh, okay, we're done with the Hive stuff, then we can focus back on things. So it's, we'll see us ping pong. Uh, yeah, I mean, and, and that's how the ETL vendors have to hook up into those right. things, right? That's how they feature yeah. it. But Hive is really important because the average enterprise wants SQL. So yeah, we exactly. definitely be focused on SQL. Is there any work going on in uh, moving data from relational databases and real time in the HDFS? Uh, right now, like the only option, right? I mean, the, the thing which we use right now is two. If yeah, there, like, I mean, there are vendors like db 2 MIBM, and things like that, where they they have their own proprietary file format, so we can't really have like a yeah. event listener to take the logs and directly put it in HDFS. So it depends on your vendor. Uh, so for example, we have a deep partnership with Teradata as Hortworks. So we have a, a highly optimized connector between Teradata and Hadoop. So depending on your database, uh, you, you find you have, a, you have lots of options. It depends on the database. Though. So if it's Teradata, you get, you get a fast connect with us. If it's Oracle, you get a fast connect with us. But there's no common answer. It's a no, because it depends on the database. Right? It depends on the format used by Oracle or DB2 or um, Teradata. Right? So each of these guys have tried a fast drive. So we've got at least a couple right now, and you'll see more of them. Is there any work being done on the HDFS, the file system itself? Yeah, lots of stuff. So one of, as part of Stinger, we're also building a buffer cache for HDFS. So we're like we're doing M lock and M, M map and M page, you know, M unlock and so on. And or, we're fixing ORC to take an M, M, lock, M map file and translate on the flight, rather than have to do the I.O. Okay. Uh, so all that stuff is coming to this part in Hydro 2. Is, is there any, I mean, uh, obviously IBM is coming up with a, a C++ based distributed file system, GFS, I think they've integrated in GFS. <laughs> <laughs> is it, yeah, this, okay, all right. All right. Any, do you know anybody like looking at Luster or any other kind of like C++ based? We don't see anybody at Hadoop scale. Yeah. Okay. That's the key. It's, it's, a few 10 nodes, 100 nodes, it's, it's so fine. Much momentum. Well, it's not just, mo well, true, momentum is one aspect. The other one is the fact that it works at 5,000 nodes. Right. So, yeah. it depends. So where does the hot on works thing vary? Because they are on the open source. <laughs> and so when it comes to the yarn, these features are completely only yeah. go through. Yeah, everything we do is ASF. We don't hold back anything. Uh, we don't. We don't even have a proprietary license, nothing. Everything goes back in the open. Yeah. Okay. So if once we put Hadoop 2.0, you're getting, regardless whether you're using Cloudera distribution or you're It depends. I don't know what they ship. Okay. I, it depends on what your vendor ships. As long as your vendor ships Hadoop 2 from ASF, you'll have the same things. So lots of vendors don't do that. So it depends on the vendor. So we will always ship 
stuff from ASF because we are we're building it in the first place. I mean, for example, Clover doesn't ship Hadoop 11. Uh, sorry, Hive 11. You only ship Hive 10. So, so it depends on the vendor. All right. Thanks. Thank you so much. Yeah. All right, and we're stopping over here.